Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's really great to see all of you um, here on this beautiful spring day, finally, where we can see the sun and we don't have to wear our heavy jackets. So it's wonderful, and I say welcome to all of those of you in the sanctuary, and of co course, those of you who are worshiping with us at home. Remember, there are a few technology announcements that we need to make. Uh, please turn off your cell phones if you are in the sanctuary. Um, you can sing and worship, but remember, you must leave your mask on. Uh, we ask you to stand and body your spirit when you're asked to do so. If the video feed is interrupted during the service, we will continue to record and then post the full video on Facebook and our website as soon as possible. We are very pleased to have Reverend Grayson Van Camp here to bring us the message while Pastor Wendy Bowden is away. She is a longtime uh, pastor at the Presbyterian Church of Western Springs. She graciously agreed to fill in very last minute after the guest preacher we had planned to have here today notified us on Wednesday they had COVID. So thank you, Reverend Van Camp. <laughs> Um, today is a Jubilee Bucks ordering day. Send your order to Bobby Fry by 9 this evening. Now, this Wednesday, e-notes will go out, but it's also the deadline for the June Dialogue. So that's also going out on the following Wednesday. Um, two kind of quick moments for mission. One is to remember we're still doing gift scroll. Okay, so either there are pew envelopes, not in the pews, but outside that you can get. And for those of you at home worshiping, you certainly can send in your uh, donations for Gifts Grow. It's one of our biggest missions, um, and it lets where your heart really pulls your strings to give the money where it can be doubled for a mission that is really important to you. So um, I encourage you to do that. I also am encouraging you to look in your bulletin as well as in your e-notes about something very exciting. We all love John Shepard, Marie and Bill's beloved son. He is allowing us to have a free screening of his film, documentary film, about the um, shooting that happened in the Manual Church um, down in Charleston. And that is going to be screened free on Sunday, June 5th at the Studio Mo Movie Grill. And um, you can invite as many people as you would like. They just need to know how many are coming. So you please need to RSVP to Angela by next Sunday. Thank you. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new.
please join me in the call to worship as found in your bulletin. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. We, we worship, worship God, God, whose love endures forever. And now please rise in body or spirit as we continue to worship God in song. Those at home and those present wearing masks may sing. at home and those here let us open our hearts and minds to the truth of our lives and let us humbly offer that truth to God will you all please join me in the prayer of confession as found in your bulletin let us pray Lord God your love endures forever and we cherish that gift most of the time we sometimes forget the commitment of faith. We own that sometimes we are angry at the slightest insult and imagine recompense upon those who have wronged us. Forgive us and wrap us in your grace. Empower us through your Holy Spirit to welcome the new creation that is within each of us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is both our Lord. Amen. And now let us continue to offer our hearts to God in silent prayer. We pray these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and Lord. Amen. Join me now in the declaration of the grace of God and the assurance of pardon. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ, and Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. 
Christ reigns in power for us. Christ intercedes for us. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Alleluia. Give thanks to the risen Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia. Give thanks to his name. Jesus is Lord. As the followers of Christ, we receive the peace beyond all understanding. So let us now offer that peace, saying to each other, the peace of Christ be with you, also with you. Peace, everyone. Peace. Well, I only, I wish I had people here besides Dan to talk to, um, but I'll talk to you guys at home and all of you grown-ups too. Today, um, when they, I was asked to do this, we came up with a topic, and the topic of the sermon has changed a little bit, but I'm still going ahead with my original plan because today's sermon has to do with love, and so does my, so does my thing. So a long time ago, way back in the 1860s, which is, in case you're wondering, way older than me, um, there were two sisters, Anna and Susan Warner, and they, um, their family had lost a lot of money, and they were really poor for a while. And so the two girls, who were young women at the time, started writing books to make money for their family. And one of the girls, Anna, particularly liked to write poems that she turned into hymns. So her sister said, why don't you write a poem for this book where I'm working on? And um, she did. And this is the poem she wrote. I'm sure you all, can you see it? No? It says, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. That's the poem she wrote. And they put it in the book, and it became very popular. And then a little while later, a few years later, um, a man who composed music found those words, and he said, this said, I want to put those words to music to make it a hymn. So he did. And to make his hymn sound better, he added the chorus. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. This song is one that all of you would have probably learned when you were small children. I know I did. And all of the kids of our church know this song. Tom plays it for us every Sunday. And um, it has been translated into more languages than any other hymn. So it's, it, and it's one that missionaries often teach people when they go to do a mission in a different country. So, um, from this we remember that Jesus loves us. We all know that. And we know it because the Bible tells us so. And then it says, little ones to him belong. So I always think that means that even if you're a little kid, you're, you belong to Jesus. And they are weak, but he is strong. To, by ourselves, we are weak. But with Jesus, we are strong. So, Today, when, you, when Tom plays our song, I want you to think about the words when you sing them. And please do sing them, everybody. And let's pray. Dear God, thank you for giving us people like Anna Warner, who tells your story through song.
that we know and love. Amen. Thank you very much for coming up and uh, filling in this morning. As any choir director can tell you, if there are no children on hand, the next best thing is a tenor. us pray. God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and taught your will. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first lesson today comes from Psalm 136, verses 1 to 9 and 26. It can be found in your pew Bible on page 756 of the Old Testament. Hear the word of God. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who alone does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever? Who by understanding made the heavens, for his steadfast love endures forever? Who spread out the earth on the waters, for his steadfast love endures forever? Who made the great lights, for his steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day, for his steadfast love endures forever. And the moon and the stars to rule over the night, for his steadfast love endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of heaven for his steadfast love love endures forever. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. The gospel lesson today, the gospel of John chapter 13, verses 31 through 35, and it's in your New Testament on page 108. Hear the word of the Lord. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so I say now to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The word of the Lord. God. I saw a short program about Tina Turner a few weeks ago, and I'm happy to report that she's well and happy and living in Switzerland. But if you're anything like me when you hear the phrase or the title of my sermon, what love got to do with it, it immediately brings to mind her 1984 award-winning song, What's Love Got to Do With It? Got to do with it, she sang. What's love but a sweet old-fashioned notion, a second-hand emotion? What's love got to do, got to do with it? Who needs a heart? The heart can be broken. It was especially poignant to hear her sing those lyrics because by the time she did so, we, the public, 
knew about the turmoil, the ugliness, and the violence that had existed in her marriage, Ike Turner. And although that marriage ended, it was obvious that it took decades for her to work with the very painful family. Was love got to do with it? If we were ever asked on a TV game show to name the qualities of love, most of us here and those streaming the service uh, tick off many, if not all, the qualities of love listed in First Corinthians chapter 13, right? We've heard them so many times, we've heard weddings. Love is patient and kind, not envious, boastful, arrogant, or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way, it's not irritable or resentful. It doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing. It rejoices in truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. These verses are so often used in wedding ceremonies because this kind of love is the most difficult kind of love. It's the kind of love that Jesus spoke about. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. The Greeks have helped our understanding of love by defining four types of love. Philios, strong liking, a deep friendship. Storge, which is the love that exists between parents and children, often between siblings, and can exist in a good marriage. Eros, sexual passionate love. And agape, the love that is the very nature of God. We are having some difficulty hearing you, so we are hoping that you might be able to hold this and talk. Do you think you can, or we can work on trying to put this? I think it'll probably work better if you can do this. Okay, I will do this. Now I feel more like Tina Turner myself. <laughs> Stop that right now. <laughs> go, go to your seat, miss. <laughs> About 20 years ago, a book by author Gary Smalley called Love as a Decision was in vogue for Presbyterian study groups. Is this better, folks? Okay, I don't know. Smalley died in 2016, but I believe his book was a blessing. He had it right. Love is a decision, not just some warm, fuzzy feeling or the desire to do good. And agape love asks, are you willing to do things for my sake that you do not want to do? Loving is difficult, and it's no wonder Jesus had to spell it out for us so many times. John recorded Jesus saying it even one more time in his gospel in the 15th chapter. Love others in the same way I have loved you. There, do you get it now, apostles, he might have added. If you and I dare to claim the title Christian, then love has everything to do with us and everything to do with the church, which brings us to what's happening now in America. Any of us who pay attention to the news or surf the internet or spend time on social media know that currently the church is in the news and not in a good way. Let's face it, the church has always had its detractors. We're an easy target, and people have long memories. We don't need to go back to the Crusades. Today's news is enough to make us wince with shame and disgust. Clergy misconduct, and clergy abuse of children, discrimination against women, Indigenous children taken from their families by churches and the government, abused and buried in unmarked graves. The shocking audacity of riches of some mega churches and their pastors. The list goes on and on, even to the support of guns in churches. William Willimon knows the mainline church very well. He's a retired United Methodist bishop still a professor of the practice of Christian ministry at Duke Divinity School. And in a passage about the church speaking uh, of the church as the bride of Christ, Willimon writes, Jesus has had many admirers who feel that he married beneath his station. The church has failed to live up to her great commission in many ways, large and small. 
Beloved author C.S. Lewis, in his insightful little book, The Screwtape Letters, describes the devil's delight in the church as one of his best allies in the battle for the souls of new converts. And just two weeks ago, I was worshiping in our son's church, and I think I was one of those people in the church who was not doing the right thing, who was making the church look bad, or at least I felt so, because there was a family with young children sitting behind me, and they were all talking at the seemed like the top of their voices during worship, and it took every inch of my being not to turn around and go, shh. <sighs> that young family, it could have been their first time, and if I had done that, I would have been one of those people bringing down the church of Jesus Christ, the church that we love. Just yesterday, the New York, in the, well, no, last week in the New York Times, Maureen Dowd uh, had an article that was published, and it was called too much church in the state. Dowd is a Roman Catholic, and she's concerned about the makeup of the Supreme Court. She writes, there's an astonishing preponderance of Catholics in the Supreme Court. Six of the nine justices and a seventh, Neil Gorsuch, was raised as a Catholic and went to the same Jesuit boys' high school in Maryland that Brett Kavanaugh and my nephew did, she says. She continues, last year at Thomas Aquinas College in California, Justice Samuel Alito fretted that there was growing cultural hostility towards Christianity and Catholicism. There's a real movement to suppress the expression of anything that opposes the secular orthodoxy, Alito said. But is it his job or the job of the justices to suppress the will of others to protect their narrow view of orthodoxy, no matter what their religion might be? If the society doesn't respect religion, Alito has said, religious liberty becomes imperiled. But I worry about religion. Nothing in what we have heard or read recently sounds very Christian to the non-believer. There are no words of comfort or compassion for women who are carrying the result of a rape or an assault or incest. No loving sympathy or solace for those with horrendously dangerous medical conditions or fetuses that simply cannot survive. I worry for the church if the liberty of nine religious people or religious people with differing beliefs is imperiled or abridged because of a minority religious viewpoint. We may be teetering on the brink. There are even some clergymen and women who are using the name of Jesus to promote armed political warfare. Is it possible that the brand Christian will continue to be used as a weapon? Will it be degraded in the eyes of the nation and continue to suffer because some Christians have forgotten their primary directives? Douglas John Hall, former pastor and emeritus professor of theology at McGill, wrote something that should be a warning to us. The conversion of Constantine, he says, was the effective beginning of Christendom, namely, of that particular form of the Christian religion that consists of a strong alliance of Christianity with political and social power, something amounting to the practice, practical identification of Christianity with the dominant forces of the society in which it finds itself. Hmm. Isn't this kind of Christianity the kind that is popping, propping up Vladimir Putin's rebellion? as we see the Russian Orthodox Church supporting his every move, we cannot let this brand of Christianity tarnish the Church of Jesus Christ here. Douglas John Hall also writes with a, an antidote to that form of false Christianity. The antidote is Jesus, he says. Jesus saves. He saves us for life, for giving ourselves over to its joys and its sorrows, to predictable and unpredictable occurrences, its routines, and its surprises. Jesus saves us from the awful habit that we have of trying to save ourselves, of sparing our energies, of protecting our minds and souls and bodies from the life struggle, 
He saves us for the spendthriftiness spend of love. I've heard Jesus' words tossed back in our faces on network TV by people who are angry at what they fear is coming from the Supreme Court. One young black woman practically screamed at the camera, I thought you Christians were all about loving one another. Well, if this is your idea of love, go to hell. As I watched that young woman's anguish, I wanted to speak with her. I wanted to put my arm around her and invite her to church, to this church, or to any church that is as loving and caring as this one is. I wish I could do the same for all the naysayers that I watch on the news and those who vilify Christianity on social media. At my ordination 30 years ago, Professor Don Wardlaw preached a sermon around the story that we know as the prodigal son, but he entitled it, Tell Them About the Prodigal Father, Jesus. He stressed the spend thriftiness of love, the father, had offered his two sons. They say that preachers often preach to themselves, and I think in my case that's true. I grew up in an Irish Catholic family, a family who disciplined with two worn out tools, guilt and shame. Reminders of the angry, frowning God of the Old Testament were served up at my house as regularly as meals. I grew up knowing that God was watching everything I did, listening to every conversation, checking every report card, every poorly done chore, and finding me wanting in it all. So it should not be a surprise when I pull out random sermons from among the 900 or so that I've preached that most of them have something at their center, an affirmation of the generous, overwhelming, undeserved, amazing, some might say, wanton, prodigal love of God. It was believing in God's unconditional love, God's amazing grace that helped me find my true identity. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Amazing grace. The naysayers just don't know, and the ones trying to judge, trying to demand, trying to have their way, they don't know either. They have no idea what real Christianity looks like. They haven't experienced church. They don't know you. You know, the other day I saw a lovely little video of turtles on Facebook. And if I had remembered all your screens, I might have brought it for you to look at. And what it was, was there was a pond full of turtles and one poor hapless thing was on his back. He was floundering and floundering. He just couldn't turn himself over. And as he did that, all the other turtles turned and sort of swam towards him, swam towards the one in the middle. And when they all got up to him, he just sort of relaxed and stopped. And together, all those turtles flipped the flailing one over. And I thought, that's an excellent metaphor for church. I wish people could understand that. Isn't that what we do as the church for those around us and for those that we seek out to aid, to be with them as they struggle, to lend aid without asking if they deserve it? without questioning how they got flipped over in the first place, to dare getting flipped ourselves in the process of helping. Michael Linval is the former pastor of Brick Presbyterian Church and First Presbyterian Church Ann Arbor. And I know him best as the author of two little books that I love so much about the adventures of a small, -time, small town pastor the good news from North Haven and leaving North Haven. Lynn Fall is such a great storyteller that this small town pastor has been invited to open the Scottish Parliament a few times. And in 2017, he was asked to preach to Queen Elizabeth when she was at Balmoral Castle with the royal family. So that's my kind of small town pastor, right? His books are full of wonderful stories from his own experience but in the pseudonym of Reverend David Battles. And one story called Our Organist is about his experience of being a guest supply pastor 
a gas supply preacher for a tiny church in a fictional town called Lake Carthage in Minnesota. I know there's water here somewhere. <laughs> The little flock of 11 souls hadn't had a minister of its own since 1939. But one Sunday each month at noon, they gather to worship and listen attentively to whatever supply preacher they can get to drive out to their dwindling little town. The clerk of the congregation, Lloyd Larson, assures the pastor of 100% attendance if he'll just come out and preach there. And he promised an organist the same organist Carthage Lake has been promising guest preachers for 60 years, Lloyd's sister-in-law, Agnes. The Sunday of his guest appearance arrived and Reverend David Battles describes the small white frame church, the large sentimental stained glass windows of Jesus, one as the good shepherd with the lamb in one arm, staff in the other, and then Jesus playing, praying alone in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the two cars and a pickup truck that were parked out front. There were actually 12 worshipers that day gathered, including a young man scattered throughout the sanctuary, sitting in their customary pews, such as you're doing this morning. Lloyd had explained that there was no bulletin in this tiny church, that the preacher should just announce the hymns. And so David nodded to the organist with her wig slightly askew, who responded with a broad toothy smile. Worship began and David announced the opening hymn. Number 204, Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. Agnes smiled at him and played, what a friend we have in Jesus. The 11 elderly members sang it by memory. Only the young man needed to pull out a hymnal. Following the sermon, David, wondering if Agnes was hard of hearing, loudly announced the next hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. He looked directly at Agnes, who smiled back and played, I love to tell this story. After the prayers and offering, he walked over to the organ bench, bent down and whispered, Agnes, what are we going to sing? She smiled and began to play, just as I am, without one plea. After worship, Agnes shook his hand, but she didn't say a word. Lloyd sheepishly explained, um, I forgot to tell you about Agnes. You don't need to tell us what the hymn is, only when. Agnes knows only those three hymns, so we always sing them. Good grief, Lloyd, you mean to tell me you've been singing the same three hymns for nearly 60 years? Lloyd was looking down then, concentrating on a little hole in the carpet. Well, he says, we like those hymns well enough, and we know them by heart, and after all, she is our organist. Later, David met the young man, Neil Larson, who explained that he was Lloyd's grandson and said, Agnes is my late grandmother's little sister, Lloyd's wife's baby sister. Agnes has never been quite right. She never says more than a few words, but she learned those hymns one week 60 years ago when our regular organist was sick. It was a moment of musical emergency around here, but anyway, she hasn't been able to learn any others since then, playing the organ this one Sunday a month means the world to her. Sometimes I think it's mostly for her that they keep the church open. Aunt Agnes lives for the first Sunday of the month. This is what church is, isn't it? Isn't this what we should be about? Showing love to one another, holding together as the varied forces of society and the rigors of time and age try to pull us apart. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do I do not have love, I am nothing. The selfless, prodigal, wanton, agape love that God in Christ Jesus offers is our new commandment. 
It's the way we're to interact with one another and with all others. Thinking of others before ourselves doesn't come easily. Jesus was aware of that. He lived among us, but he told us time and time again to love one another, to love one another as we love ourselves, to love one another as he loved us. But then he showed us by his model in life and by his death for our sake. You and I know what selfless human behavior looks like. We've seen it expressed in the body of Christ right here. Right here and now, it's changing hearts and minds, changing lives. If only we could share that with the world, what a different place it would be. After that service in First Presbyterian Church of Carthage Lake, Neil Larson lingered on. Aunt Agnes lives for the first Sunday of the month, he said to David Battles. Sometimes I think it's mostly for her that they keep the church open. They asked me to play, of course, he went on. They had to ask, but Grandpa knew I'd say no. I remember how he sighed with relief when I said no, and then he slapped me on the back. You're an organist, the preacher asked. Eastman, class of 84. I've had some big church jobs. The last one down in Texas, big church, brand new organ, 102 ranks, four services a Sunday. But then I got sick. I've been HIV positive for six years. The personnel committee of the church figured it out, I guess, the weight loss, all the six sick days, the fact that I'm not married. They told me it would be best if I moved on, but not till after Christmas, of course. My parents live in St. Paul, but my father and I haven't spoken since I was 19. I'm not sick enough to be in the hospital, just too tired most of the time. I had nowhere to go. My grandfather said I could move in with him and Agnes, and to tell you the truth, I feel right at home in a town of 80-year-olds. He paused and went on. They keep Agnes, and they took me in. And since I moved up here, most every night, Lloyd or old man Engstrom from down the road opens up the church for me. If it's cold, they lay a wood fire in the little stove, and then I play the organ. It's a sweet little instrument, believe it or not. Lloyd's kept it up all these years. These last weeks, it's been almost warm in the evenings, so they leave the doors and the windows of the church open, and everybody sits out on their front porch, and they listen to me play. Bach, Buxtehude, Vidor, all the stuff I love, and they clap from their porches. Even Agnes claps. Jesus said, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Amen. Will you please stand as we say what we believe with our affirmation of faith. Let us affirm what we believe as Christians. Let us say together, with believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now let us continue to worship God in song. Those at home and those present wearing masks may sing. We are singing hymn number 301, Let Us Build a House.
Be seated. And now, Pastor Grayson will go ahead and lead us in the prayers of the people. Center us, Creator God, precious Jesus, Holy Spirit, as we stop to pray. Hear our prayers, both silent and spoken, as we pray for those near and far who need your care. This morning, especially, we pray for Pastor Wendy and Blair Nelson for God's grace as they travel to Canada for Blair's mother's memorial service. Help us to have ears to listen and eyes to see in order to discern those among us that need your loving care and make us instruments of your love and grace. Continue to bless your church throughout the world. Sustain her with your love. Correct her when she fails. Fill her with hope as she strives to obey the Great Commission. We pray for the world and those nations where violence, greed, and tyranny cause enormous suffering. We pray for women, men, and children who are hungry, thirsty, for those who are homeless, and for those who have been driven from their homes by wars and violence. God of abundant love, we feel so helpless at times. So we also lift to you our own fears, our needs. Fill us with hope. Help us to truly love one another. Empower us to feed your sheep. Especially now as we watch the carnage of the war in Ukraine, Lord, we pray for lives lost and hearts broken. We know that all are safely in your embrace. We ask that the war might end, that peace might reign. We ask for comfort and peace for those in the struggle, and we lift to you those who have died, praying as our Orthodox brothers and sisters pray, may their memory be eternal. But Lord, we also pray that you stir us to action in their memory. Continue to challenge us to do all that's possible in our realm to promote peace and justice in our homes, in our country, and in our world. Help us to truly love our neighbor. Lord of life, remind us daily of your vision for our world, that as people of renewed faith and vitality, we may be empowered to serve you as you desire us to serve. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. God bless all the world. Guard our children. Guide our leaders. And give us peace. And now together we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those. Temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, as we listen to our offertory, let us offer all that we have and all that we are to God.
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, God of heaven and earth. You call us to come in humility before you, bringing the offering of our very selves. Accept all that we have, accept all that we are, O oh God, in the service of Jesus Christ, and strengthen us with your Spirit's power, now and forevermore. Amen. And now let us continue to worship God in song. Those at home and those present wearing a mask may sing. Hymn 39, Great is Thy Faithfulness. This day is to continue to build a house here where love can dwell, where all are welcome in Christ's name. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Now go and serve the Lord. The cross. We shall take it. The bread. We shall break it. We shall bear it. The joy. We shall share it. The gospel. 
We shall live it. By love. We shall give it. By life. We shall cherish it. By darkness. God shall perish it. For the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.